In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So today we read a gospel that we're familiar, familiar with, um, a story that we all know about, which is the raising of Lazarus. And we see many things, there's many lessons uh, when it comes to this story that we can learn. And if you'll notice, the readings of the day in general are focused on the idea of the truth and the idea of living a true Christian life. Um, Because a lot of the times we tend to be either having one mindset about what what is the true Christian life or we tend to think we're living the right Christian life when we're actually, in a way, going astray. And we see the consequences of both, right? We see uh, in, the, in, the, in the Acts of the Apostles how the people who wanted to exercise the demons and they weren't really faithful, like they weren't faithful Christians, but, you know, they're like in the name of Jesus, right? And then what, what ended up happening? The devil did one of the things that actually is, to me, is one of the funniest things that happened in the Bible. He told them, Jesus, I know. Paul and the apostles, I know. And he, <laughs> who are you, right? Like, who, who, who do you think you are, right? And he embarrassed these people in the midst of everyone. And actually, funny enough, this kind of thing happens today, but we don't really realize it. Um, sometimes in, in, in some churches, they have practices like this where people believe that they are exercising demons or talking, speaking in tongues and all these things, right? And then, you know, they have many followers, many, many followers that start to follow them. And then you'll find kid, one small video that exposes them or something that says, you know, woman does not fall when pastor puts uh, his hand on her forehead, Right. And then what happens to all these people that followed this pastor or, or this teacher? They all start, dis- they don't believe anymore. So the game is still being played the same today. But the devil has many other tools. He doesn't really need to beat up these people in front of everyone for them to be embarrassed. We have social media to do that for us. And this leads to something. This leads to what I like to call or what the church likes to call the spiritual death whenever there's a lot of falsehoods or a lot of wrong ideologies around us, it causes a spiritual death. And it's very poetic how the gospel that is placed today for us to read was the story of Lazarus. And we see in the gospel how the story revolves around a person who's dead and ultimately Christ ends up raising him from the dead. We can look at this gospel and contemplate about the spiritual death And we can contemplate on many things. On, for example, why is it that God sometimes allows for people to be completely dead spiritually? Sometimes we wonder, why does God allow things to happen? Why is God allowing a tribulation in my life to go so deep? Why is he allowing my son or my daughter to be having atheistic thoughts? Why is God allowing for so many of our youth to be led astray? These questions come to us as servants and as faithful Christians. Until when, O Lord? And we see here the same attitude came from no other but Mary, who knew Christ very well. She knew that he does miracles. She's aware of how powerful Christ is. Yet she says to him in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right? And it shows something. Does this mean that Mary is a bad person? No. Mary is a human being like every one of us. Right? All of us, because we are human beings, we are weak. And sometimes whenever we find ourselves alone or we cannot explain a certain situation, our impulse is to what? Is to say, where are you, Lord? If you were here, this wouldn't have happened. But there is a reason. There is a reason why Christ allowed for the death of Lazarus. And this is the same reason why Christ today allows sometimes for things to seem like they're getting worse. Because in order for the lesson to be learned, if you read in in the very end, at the very, very end of the gospel, it says that many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things, Jesus did, believed in him. Right? We sometimes take this for granted. 
sometimes we say like, okay, like I'm, I'm in the middle of a, 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 a tribulation or I'm having doubtful thoughts or someone I know is having doubtful thoughts. God, please take this away from us now. We don't want this to get worse. We, we see how things can get, right? We know that the start, uh, yani the beginning of the road for somebody who is, who is spiritually dead starts with, with doubt, starts with living in, in ways of life that, in a double way of life, meaning that sometimes we see our sons and daughters can be coming to the church and having a church life and everything, but outside the church, they have a completely different life. And this hurts the parents and the servants and Abuna. And then we say, God, please take this, help them right now. And sometimes it seems like God isn't listening, right? But here's the thing. When Christ interferes and, and raises them from the dead, not only will they become faithful again or become alive spiritually again, but those around as well will believe. You know, I believe that if Christ was to just heal him before he died, it would have been just an, a miracle that the Jews see all the time. But if they were, if, if these Jews who were close to Lazarus' family knew Christ and they didn't believe, based on this verse, it seems like they never believed before. Because it says, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary, gain, like they, they came to offer condolences, and when they had seen these things, they believed in Jesus. If they were going to believe because of a miracle of healing, they would have already a long time ago. But the wisdom of Christ here that is beyond our perception, the human perception, is that not only is Lazarus going to be rising from the dead, and an ultimate joy will be there, but also the people who had a hard time believing will also believe. So it's very important for us to understand sometimes that yes, there is spiritual death. There is a lot of things out there, but Christ allows for these things to happen, right? Not because he's ignoring or he just wants us to, to ask harder, خلاص. no, but actually he, in the right time, when, he is, when he's truly glorified in what he does, not only will it be for the benefit of the person, but for everyone around. And this is very important to remember, especially in the day and age that we're living in today. A day, a day and age that is filled with many falsehoods, many things that are uh, very, very deceitful and things around us that can truly, um, yani, or it, it is truly and currently destroying the world ideologically. We live in a world today that really is dead in a lot of ways, right? Truth has become dead. Logic thinking has become has become no longer valid. It's well it's about what I want to believe. I am the one who's in power. Everything is about me. Everything is about what I believe. Everything is about oh and what I believe based on what the media is feeding me or what the current events are feeding me, right? If I believe something that goes against these uh, trends or these agendas, then that's it. It's done. I'm canceled. But we live in a world today where the world is pushing and pushing really hard for people to be less and less accountable, less and less alive. It's almost like the devil wants to kill us from within, to kill our conscience to the point that even simple things such as accountability or saying things as they are or recognizing truth has become doubtful. I can now, today I live in a world where I can determine, what, like if I wake up today feeling like a boy, I'm a boy. If I wake up feeling like a girl, I'm a girl. And no one can say anything to you. On the contrary, it is now outlawed in some countries for you to speak against this. And so on and so forth with all the different agendas that are going on. And this is one of the worst kinds of spiritual deaths. Our hope is in the Lord that he, in the right time He will interfere. In the right time He will be glorified. But for us as Christians, what we have to do is we have to hold on very tight. We have to be awake and we have to understand um, deeply how to not only survive spiritually in this environment but how we can raise our children and how we can be an influence to others around us in this environment in order for us to be able to have soldiers in this fight the spiritual fight um, and of course the most powerful weapons that we have are what number one prayer right prayer doesn't mean that I, and I just stand and I do my spiritual canon and that's it 
It's not a magic spell like that. I stand there and I say my prayer and yay, I've become a saint. Now I'm going to start, you know, holy oil is going to come out of me and my hands are going to start to shine. No. Right. Or I'm, I'm going to pray right now. And then, yeah, and you know, sometimes we take prayer. Okay. I'm going to go pray right now. And God is going to give me the, the, he's going to provide the car that I've always wanted. That's not how it works. Right. Or one of my favorites is like, yeah, Abuna, um, like in Arabic, and I'll try to translate it. It was bis salah, right? Like, like, you know, give me an extra, like, extra prayers, like, like as if this is, you know, like a water burger with cheese or something, you know? Like, yani, that's not how prayer works. It's not how powerful Abuna prays for you on the altar that determines if the prayer is answered or not, right? It's from your heart. It's from your heart if you truly believe. All the prayers in the world, if they're not with faith, are worthless. If it's just a routine, it's worthless. So true prayer, real prayer, meaning that I lift up my heart to God. I stand in front of God and I ask Him for everything that I need from my heart. And I will, and, and not just that. I'm, I should be standing and praying, expecting that He will answer in His timing, not my timing. That's why we say, thy will be done. But sometimes we like to say, my will be done without noticing. So that's the, the first and most important thing. Secondly, you know, as normal human beings, when we talk, we like to be responded to or we like some kind of response, right? And that's, that's the regular, the regular uh, scenario. Now, I'm not talking about like sometimes I know husbands are looking at me right now because they're like, Abuna, you don't know our wives. They talk and they don't let us answer it, but that's not what I'm talking about, okay? In a regular conversation, not a fight, right? We usually, eh, we like to talk and we like to, to hear a response. Just imagine, kid, if you ask your kids something and they don't respond, you're going to be like, I asked you something, please respond, right? And this is a regular scenario. So I would expect or I would think that everybody who talks to God wants to hear a response. And we hear this response in what? In the gospel, in the Bible. The Bible is where we hear the responses of God in, for our prayers, right? The scripture has a lesson in every verse for every situation in our life. The Bible is the only book where you can read the same passage every day and get a different lesson out of it forever. Otherwise, priests would have run out of sermons a long time ago, right? We can stand here and we, we can talk about the same gospel for days and days and days and come up with different lessons. Why? Is it because Abuna is so smart? No. It's because, it's because the, the lessons in the gospel are 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 infinite they're limitless and so the responses of god are limitless he's infinite so therefore his responses are infinite and third we need to have and i say this all the time is accountability and accountability comes with confession real confession true confession from our hearts confession is not um okay i booked an appointment with abuna in two days i have two days to live my life back I can do anything I want. Confess one, get one free. Yeah, I, 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 I do anything I want because I know I'm going to go confess. Like, let me do whatever I want. This is not how it works. Confession is when I sit down and I keep myself accountable. Think of somebody you really care about that you upset. How much does it kill us from within us? that I can't believe I upset this person. Of course, this is, Yanni, if, uh, if we have feelings, Yanni, if, if you don't, you can talk to me after because we have a problem. But um, like when we upset someone, anyone who has somebody really dear to their heart, even if they're very quiet, they'll want to know what to do to what? To make it up to them. They care. People care about the ones they love. And if we say that we love God above anything else, we need to keep ourselves accountable to the things that upset God. God has done so much for us in our lives. If we're not able to keep ourselves accountable, we will never be alive spiritually. Confession is 90% accountability for my own actions and 10% is talking to Abuna. It's not even 50-50. 90% is me sitting with myself and getting out like a list kidda, and writing down or thinking about the things that I've done wrong. Who have I wronged? What have I done right? What have I done wrong? What is my, I mean, what do I think I want to do to make things better? And apologize to God. And then once we've done that, 
And we go talk to Abuna, we get the spiritual advice and we get the absolution. And that's the 10%. Of course, this doesn't mean bad. Okay, Abuna is saying 90%, so I, uh, from 90 to 100 is A, so I want to get A in repentance, and that's it. That is not how it works when it comes to repentance. With repentance, it has to be 100%. has to be 100%. Meaning that we do the 90 and we do the 10. It doesn't mean that the 90% which is keeping myself accountable is enough. Don't misquote me. So, it's very important. And why is this important on, on a personal or social level? A person who can keep accountable for their own actions in front of God will be accountable in front of others. We see in this world a lot of trends of dishonesty and people do things that are ruthless. We say like, how can someone have the heart or the guts to do this? It's because they don't have the they don't have this accountability for themselves. They care. It, it, they become selfish. People become selfish when they don't when they don't keep themselves accountable for their actions. And we see this in, in many things on a deeper level within our homes. If there's somebody in our home or somebody in our family that doesn't apologize when some when when um, when they do something wrong, you will notice almost every time that this person has a problem with confession. And actually, the one thing that can really kill this trend is confession. Because you're sitting, saying what you've done wrong. So it gets you in the habit of learning how to apologize. Right? Because today, we either don't apologize, or the other trend is saying sorry when we don't. It's like, sorry. You know, like, like uh, I'm just saying it, kid. Like, just doing what, يعني, doing, doing what I need to. I'm sorry. Or I apologize. Or sorry I offended you. Right? And it's... It, and, People know when someone is truly apologizing and when somebody doesn't mean it. God forbid that we do this with God. But and then the fourth and most important thing is unity. And unity comes through one important thing that we partake of every week on this altar. And that's the communion. Communion is what unites us together. It's so beautiful that in our Orthodox Church, that the communion, right, we have communion from the same bread which turns into the body and from the same cup that has the wine which turns into the blood right it's a very strong symbol it's not just random it's not because urban tastes good and this is how we do it and like we like the stamp it looks fancy we're fancier than other churches no there's a symbol to why th things are the way they are the reason why it's one urbana like this is because it is a strong symbol of that we are all united in the body of Christ, in the one body of Christ. This is why we all eat of the same urbana, right? And in the history of the church, the way the urban or the way um, the offering was traditionally was that I'm sure many of you read this that the offering because people were poorer at the time and many of them were farmers, they would offer um, like the the actual wheat. And, and they would take that, like every family would offer their portion and they would take all of that and they would grind it together into flour and they would take this flour and make the urban uh, that they use for the liturgy. So every single one of the families, every single person is within every one of those urbanas that turns into the body of Christ. You see how beautiful the symbolism is of this? You see how powerful it is? You see how much this means to the heart of Christ for us to be united and the one thing that breaks truly the strength of Christianity today or the Christian churches today um, is the lack of unity. Christianity as a religion will always be strong and powerful. But it, us as Christians, what weakens us today, why our voice is diminishing more and more is because we're losing unity. The more we're united, the more we'll be strong. Compare what's going on in the lands of freedom here in the West to the Middle East. Why is the Middle East, even though there's actual physical persecution, why is the church still powerful and getting stronger? Why? Because everyone is united. Because the ideologies are united. But the more liberal we get in Christianity, I'm not talking about politics, the more we, we become liberal in our Christian beliefs, the more that we become weak, the more that we are compromised, and the more that other agendas have power over us. We're living in a time where this is a true test of our Christianity, by the way, this ideological persecution. And it's important that we, we are awake and that we are aware of the things that are going on in order for us to not only uh, just survive, but for us to grow 
the coming generations that will defend the faith. Right. One of the things that I always hear, like with 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 people that are like, oh, I don't think I ever want kids in this messed up world. If every single person said this, that they don't want kids. Well, who's going to fight for the truth after that? Who's who are going to be the soldiers of truth? Why do we take it out of fear today? We read in the Sinexar about a 12 year old saint. And you heard my comment. Right. Saint Abinob was 12 years old. He gave up everything and went through hor horrific tortures for the faith. His parents rose, and he had raised him to be this kind of powerful soldier. Every parent or every future parent should have a mind. I'm going to raise my kids to be soldiers in the army of Christ. Right? It's very important for us to keep this mentality. So the four things that we remember, just get us so we are refreshed, is what? The first one is prayer, true prayer. The second one is reading the scripture. The third one is confession. And the last one is communion for us to keep our unity. May God always unite the church and may we always be strong in the faith and be able to have wisdom in these tough times that we live in. And glory be to God forever. Amen.